Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome. Um, thank you so much for taking the time on Wednesday morning or evening to join us for this conversation. Yeah. Your oh, name. my name. My name is Maurizio Benazzo. My name is Zaya Benazzo, and we are the co-founders of Science and Non-Duality. And in the past two years, we've been hosting these monthly conversations uh, in which we have a guest speaker and we have a conversation with them. Yes. So today we are delighted yeah. to have back with us Mauro, Mauro. Zapatera. Mauro, yeah. good to see you again. It's been a couple of years. Uh, no, more than a couple. 2018. 2018. Four or five years, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. good to see you again. Yeah, and Mauro appeared at Sand a long time ago, and it was such a when Sand, the beginning of Sand, and uh, it was such a joy to meet you because you're you always had this angle that people were puzzled. Wait, are you a doctor? Why do you say those things? Is a you doctor always, or a mistake? <laughs> yeah, I said, well, wait, wait, what's? <laughs> well, no, it's, and it's very rare to have so a rare. rigorous scientist with such a rigorous background who understands also deep mysticism. Yeah, very rare very to find rare. that. So, um, yeah, we're delighted. Yeah, yes, should we do a, an formal official case? formal uh, introduction in case uh, some of you or um, some of you don't know Mauro? So, Mauro Zapatera obtained his MD and PhD from Harvard Medical School has been practicing mindfulness since 1998 and teaching mindfulness to patients with chronic pain since then, since 2018, actually, sorry. is the director of multi multidisciplinary care at, at Sinovation Medical Group, has published numerous scientific paper and medical book chapters on the cerebrospinal fluid, disability, and pain management. Also published three books, I am all one and all love exploring topic of awareness primarily for kids, but really for people of all ages. It's also published, Close Your Eyes, What Do You See? With His Son, which is a story about imagination and intention. He continued to create programs to help patients with chronic pain and to investigate the cerebrospinal fluid and integrate this new research to evolve the hypotheses of the cere cerebrospinal fluid and I am. And I want to add that your video on YouTube on our channel drove me crazy because I read all the comment and there was, there was a time that I received five comments a day. It's so beautiful. Everybody got so, ah! and, and a proof of this is the fact that we have, you know, that over a thousand people signed for this uh, event. And this actually, I wanted to ask people, if you could just put one word in the chat, what brought you here today to this conversation? Mm -hmm. Could be two words, if it's too hard. <laughs> Humility, Humility, consciousness, body work. Body work, curious source, curiosity. I, Kundalini, synchronicity, yeah, opening, faith. Oh, source, under, re relevant, curiosity, unique curiosity. association, craniosacral therapy, therapy CSF. My CSF is... CFS is curious, <laughs> traumatic brain injury, your email topic of interest to us, expansion, quality information, osteopathic Static manual therapy, therapy. craniosacral therapies, NADI, NADI, because, because it, it makes, makes sense. sense. <laughs> Mara is saying astrology, Ooh, Kundalini and science, Kundalini way. Curiosity, <laughs> wow. this is neurological damage, photo biomodulation assist, wow. lymphatic wow. flow. Whoa, whoa, okay. Confirm Thank you. My what, a, what a question. <laughs> wow. Beautiful. So just to know today, Maru will start with Maru doing a presentation for us. So we have the foundation of his understanding and experience, and then we're going to open and receive your questions. So with that. Yep. Let's do it. Mauro. Mauro is all yours. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for uh, inviting me. Um, it's always a pleasure to, to come to Sand and to, uh, to, do these, uh, to, do, to do these presentations and really share this work with everybody. Um, I know that uh, many people are coming to it from uh, obviously different walks of life. And, uh, and um, what you could tell from all those comments is just 
you know how uh, how uh, multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary this um, this this uh, topic can actually be. We could go into you know the cerebrospinal fluid and chiropractics and osteopathic manipulation. We could go into the cerebrospinal fluid and Kundalini. Um, we could go into just the basics of you know the science of the cerebrospinal fluid. Um, and and today it's really about kind of where this work has um, come from and where it's um, it's developing to. Of which it's really applicable, in my opinion, to all those um, all those topics and 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 concepts and it's really about um this connection this connection to source via the cerebrospinal fluid um and uh you know for me um this fluid has been very important um since 2005 2004 when i started uh, investigating it when i started studying it when i started having a direct experience of it um, and so, uh, we, you know, my wife and I, we've actually named our third child Amrita, um, Amrita or Amrit being, um, being the sacred nectar of immortality, uh, that is, that is released, uh, in, in, in the Kachari Mudra practice. And so it's, it's, it's the hypothesis that the Amrit, the Amrita, the sacred sweet nectar uh, of immortality uh, that is released is actually the cerebrospinal fluid. It's actually what the, um, what, what, what some of the, um, what some of the Indian, Indian saints and gurus when they, when they, when they tasted this nectar, it's actually they're tasting a bit of the cerebrospinal fluid. So we decided to name our, um, our third child Amrita. And, and that's how, you know, that's how, uh, influential the, this fluid is to, um, to me, uh, and to us for both my wife and, um, and myself. So, um, I have some very basic intentions, right? I don't mean to do anything like, uh, extraordinary, let's say my number one intention is really to bring awareness to this incredible fluid, the cerebrospinal fluid. That's it. Okay. If I could stop there and just say, look we have um you know we have 250 participants right now um and 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 we're bringing awareness to this fluid we've done our job okay in my opinion that's it okay the next one then if i could encourage you right is to encourage you to investigate it for yourself with openness playfulness and curiosity and what was fascinating is i saw a lot of curiosities on that right i'm curious 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 right and 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 to come to it with a very uh, with an, with an open mind, um, but also uh, a playful mind, as if you are a child playing with water for the first time. Okay, trying to kind of understand what it is. What, how how does this work? Wait, if I do this, what happens? Um, and having a, a, a being curious about it, right? Um, then obviously discuss some of the current research on the function of this fluid discuss some of the current applications for health and then hypothesize and this is kind of where it goes uh beyond let's say the realm of 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 what we of what we understand from a very you know scientific rigorous uh perspective um is is to hypothesize on other functions it it may have okay so um in your brain you have fluid filled cavities okay the fluid filled cavities are called ventricles they're called ventricles. So we could just stop there and say, uh, oh, I didn't know that, or I did know that. And I've done a lot of work with the cerebrospinal fluid and I know exactly where those, where those ventricles are. But we could spend an entire afternoon sort of investigating these ventricles, looking at these fluid filled cavities, looking at the connections that these fluid filled cavities make with the brain. And I do encourage you, if you are curious, to go into that investigation for yourself. We don't have the time to do that today, so I'm going to I'm going to move on. But just to just to just to start off with in the middle of your brain, you have these fluid filled ventricles. OK these fluid filled ventricles are filled with what we call the cerebrospinal fluid uh, it is a clear fluid that bathes the, the brain uh, and the spine and it's 99 percent water you'll see why i make a point of that uh, later on um, so it occupies the these cavities or ventricles within the brain and this would be sort of a, a three-dimensional model of what that looks like if i was to take the brain away 
Okay, very curious model. You can always kind of look at that model itself and say, why would a, a fluid filled space in the middle of the brain be so uh, complex and so intricate and have these little, you know, what we call these little aqueducts or connections between spaces and, and this shape is very curious. Um, and, and, you know, we can get into those, into the, in, into those questions, but those are the ventricles. That's what it looks like in the middle of the brain. It covers the whole outside of the brain. Uh, it goes all the way down. So in the middle of your spinal cord, many people don't know this, but in the middle of your spinal cord, there's actually a hollow, uh, a hollow tube. Uh, and it, and, and the fluid is all the way, it all, goes all the way down the middle of your spinal cord, the middle of your spinal cord, right? And then it also bathes the outside of your spinal cord. Um, at any point in time, we have 150 milliliters uh, and it turns over three to four times a day. Some people say maybe five to six times a day. And so we produce anywhere uh, about half a liter of cerebrospinal fluid a day. So we're constantly producing this, right? Remember, go get a half a liter of bottle of, of water and see what that what that is. OK, um, the third ventricle which is a midline space. It's actually a midline space. If you were to draw a line sort of at the tops of your ears, kind of where you would imagine your third eye being, there's actually a third ventricle. It's called the third ventricle. Um, and uh, this is actually a, a very important, um, a important structure. It's a very midline structure. Um, and it's got the pineal gland in the back. Um, it's got the hypothalamus and the thalamus on the sides, and it has the, 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 the pituitary gland in front. And it connects, um, you could tell, it connects a lot of really major uh, important structures of the brain from the pineal gland to the hypothalamus and the thalamus, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So just kind of bringing your awareness to this anatomy that is present in all of us. So if we were to look at this, Okay, from a, this is an MRI image. The red is our cerebrospinal fluid. So you can see how our central nervous system, both uh, brain and spine, is really kind of floating and being bathed by this cerebrospinal fluid at all times. Um, which, you know, just kind of looking at that being like, wow, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's really fascinating, right? So then I took that picture and I kind of made it into this picture, which would be cerebrospinal fluid on the outside, but also cerebrospinal fluid in the middle. And then the brain, which is the pink here, being uh, the brain and the spinal cord, right? So if you kind of, you know, jump up and down like this, right? What's happening is actually uh, the cerebrospinal fluid is actually creating buoyancy uh, for our brain and spinal cord. Okay, so here's this structure that's in the middle. <laughs> it's in the middle of our bodies, right, with a midline going right through our, our 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 spine, kind of bobbing up and down like you would see a a, a buoy in the ocean. Right now, now what what one of the main functions that people thought the cerebrospinal fluid uh, had and and did. Um, which it does, of course, is create this buoyancy. So if you were to take the brain um, of a human, uh, the human brain is about 14 to 1500 grams. When it's suspended in the cerebrospinal fluid, it has a weight of about 25 to 50 grams. So you can just tell how much, um, how much buoyancy is actually created by the cerebrospinal fluid itself. Okay. Um, so this is important from multiple perspectives. And if you've seen any of my prior uh, videos, um, I go into this. Uh, some videos I go into much more detail on embryology, but there is, I can't stress this enough, there is an importance to our development um, embryologically uh, in terms of how this fluid is created, but also embryologically, because there are certain states that we may get into um, through various techniques that we use that we might actually feel a connection back to our embryonic state. And um, it's, 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 it's my hypothesis that that connection might actually be through the fluid and you'll see why that, um, why that is. Okay, so uh, where does this fluid come from? So that little black dot in the middle, um, this, uh, that's you as you're developing as an embryo but the entire egg and sperm uh has um has has developed the red and 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 the um and the blue there that would be as you are actually implanted in your mother's uterus you start developing but just to show you you know we're uh we're essentially a layer of cells 
So we, from the egg, the egg gets fertilized um, and, and, you know, we can go into a whole bunch of detail on that, but we won't go into that. And then when you get, uh, when, when the, uh, when the embryo is implanted into the womb, then it starts to undergo more differentiation. Fluid starts to be uh, secreted into these cavities. And you can see here, that there's three major cavities. There's the amniotic cavity here with the amniotic fluid. There's the yolk sac and the chorionic cavity here um, with the chorionic fluid. And as the embryo develops, the chorionic fluid cavity gets dispersed. The yolk sac gets internalized the yolk sac gets internalized and then the embryo what you are right you as an a, a, a baby in the womb you're swimming in amniotic fluid okay so this is you uh, essentially this little black dot here as a as, as a as a as a single layer double layered sheet of cells okay and um where the cerebrospinal fluid comes from is that that layer of cells off my phone that layer of cells uh, invaginates and fuses back on itself and it makes what we call the neural tube and inside then so now we have the differentiation of the amniotic fluid from the cerebrospinal fluid okay and just kind of keep that in mind that there is this differentiation of the amniotic fluid from the cerebrospinal fluid so um, I've said this in the past so from a homeopathic perspective, right? What, what homeopathy is sort of the, a, 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 a uh, um, like taking, you know, taking a compound and, 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 and making its concentration so small, but still having the presence of that compound in the fluid itself. Well, believe it or not, we have a homeopathic quantity of our amniotic fluid still in our cerebrospinal fluid today. From a from a homeopathic perspective, uh, it was derived from that fluid, uh, and so it still has that energy of the of the amniotic fluid, um, almost guaranteed. Um, and so when we develop, so we have this neural tube here, okay, and inside now the neural tube, inside that neural tube is all cerebrospinal fluid. Outside is amniotic fluid. And, and then you can see how sort of the brain and the spinal cord develop here, right? And then this is the cortex. This is kind of the, the, the thing that we sort of pay so much attention to. Um, but we're all kind of in, in this fluid, okay? So um, what is the role of the, 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 the cerebrospinal fluid? Well, you know, we really need to look evolutionarily too to kind of set a picture of this. So evolutionarily, so when they look at the neurons um, in starfish, for instance, that are making contact with the seawater, okay, evolutionarily, the neurons in a starfish that are making contact with seawater are the same neurons in, in a vertebrate like a mouse or in us that is making contact with the cerebrospinal fluid. All right. So that's really important because evolutionarily, these neurons are important for transmitting information uh, from the fluid to some sort of body creature or something like that. All right. So the neurons that we're contacting, OK, the seawater. Right. So getting information from the seawater are evolutionarily the same neurons that today in us are contacting the cerebrospinal fluid and still getting information, right? So you can imagine what kind of information that would be, right? M movement of fluid flow, um, maybe lightness and darkness, uh, toxins or, 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 or you know, uh, poisons in the, in the water, whatever it might be, but they have to sort of interpret this, um, this, this information. Right. And as development happened and the body plan closed, right, similar to our development where our body plan closed. So in the worm, in the worm, for instance, in like a sea worm where you get. Um, you really want to contact where you get uh, closure of the body plan, you're going to get this mixing of fluids, you're going to get the mixing of an internal fluid. But it's just the seawater that's going through the body of the worm and then external fluid, which is the seawater. So you start differentiating this sort of internal seawater, external seawater. And then as we close off, right, so imagine the amniotic fluid now. That's why I brought that up. The amniotic fluid 
being sort of that external seawater and then our body plan closing and now we have the internal seawater of the cerebrospinal fluid uh, in inside of us right so evolutionarily just kind of thinking of 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 of, of that of this of the fluid being able to then contact these neurons that were then transmitting information. And so what sort of information was the fluid actually able to bring to the, the starfish or the worm or to us? And so that's kind of a big question, right? So for us, what we know is that it transports nutrients and hormones um, in the central nervous system. It regulates uh, circadian rhythm. It regulates appetite. It provides guiding cues for cell migration. So imagine that, right? The fluid itself can provide a cue for where a cell is to migrate, okay? Based on the movement of the fluid itself. It's kind of incredible. Uh, it instructs stem cells to proliferate or differentiate. It creates an ionic balance. It eliminates waste. Um, it supports and protects the central nervous system. And then it creates this buoyancy and the shock absorber for the brain. Okay. Um, this research has really been building and developing. And, uh, and, and, and in 2019, uh, researchers at Boston University showed that there was, um, there was cerebrospinal fluid pulsations into the brain itself during sleep and this is work that had been done in 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 rodents prior in like 2014-15 and it was actually shown in humans as well and so why is this important well um, first of all we always thought that the cerebrospinal fluid was sort of housed in the ventricles right in these cavities but what this research actually showed is that it actually can get can go into the brain tissue itself, but it, there needs to be certain states that induces this sort of opening of of the gates, let's say, and allows the cerebrospinal fluid to flow from, let's say, the ventricles into the brain tissue itself. OK, and what they found was that during sleep, there was a coupling of brain activity, brain waves, blood flow and CSF movement. Okay, so that when, um, when there is a change in neuronal activation, meaning the, 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 the neurons actually changed activation, there was a slowing of the brain waves. Okay, there was a flow of blood out of the head. So slowing of brain waves, flow of blood out of the head, pulsation of CSF into the head into the cranium into the third ventricles into the ventricles and then the gates that usually keep this fluid sort of in the ventricles opened up right and now the fluid is going through the brain tissue itself okay and what was postulated was essentially is that the brain is washed you know as our brain washed during sleep i saw a couple of media uh ads on that but that the brain is washed or cleansed during sleep with the, with the cerebrospinal fluid. And so it was one of the first researches that showed that um, sleep was really important because at first we didn't really know what sleep was doing, what, why it was so important. But it sort of seems like it, it comes in and it cleanses out toxins uh, in the brain that just naturally occur over um, over um, over the day from just using your brain. Right. So just thinking and breakdown of sugars and whatnot, right? So this is really important because um, this movement of cerebrospinal fluid seems to be a very important uh, process in cleansing the brain. And this may be a very important process in say, trying to prevent or decrease neurodegenerative diseases or help people with concussion or traumatic brain injury to heal by actually cleaning out the brain and by bringing in new growth factors, new molecules, um, whatever it might be, new hormones into the brain for neurogenesis, for health, for healing, whatever it might be, right? So imagine, right, that there's, that there's this importance now. So this is the first time where it showed like, oh, it's important for this fluid to actually move. Just like it is any fluid body to move really if you think of it as a river in the middle of your spine we don't want the fluid to be stagnant right and so therefore any stagnant fluid starts to develop debris 
and you know you see a stagnant river there's algae there's bugs it starts smelling right maybe that's the same in the cerebrospinal fluid that the stagnation actually toxins build up and as the toxins build up you have less ability to clear the fluid easily and so now now you have toxins building up you're not clearing the fluid you're not thinking properly maybe you're getting headaches you're not regenerating your tissue as well right and now you're going down into a slippery slope so sleep may be really important for that okay that's sort of uh that's a that's a that's a that's a big one but um there's also many hypotheses that you know fluids absorb store and transmit energy here's some bach flower remedies i spoke a bit about homeopathy um you know some of the first research in homeopathy was actually published in some excellent journals if you go back to it um part of it was not reproduced and then you know people poo pooed it but to be, i mean if you look at the studies on reproducibility of scientific um of scientific studies over 50 percent of scientific studies can't be reproduced that we think are like you know that we put on a pedestal and we say oh this is how it works well when you try to reproduce it doesn't work well we don't go back and 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 say oh you know it sucks it's like oh maybe the conditions weren't the right conditions or whatever it might be there's so much control that happens in a laboratory um that um that just because you can't reproduce something doesn't mean that it's not true or doesn't mean that it hasn't happened and if it happens once then in my opinion if it happens once then let's figure out what the right sort of circumstances or mechanism is for it to happen again right and so this is some of the work of Masuro Emoto um, of freezing water molecules Dean Radin has tried to reproduce this uh, with double blind triple controlled studies um, and has actually done a, a, a fairly different a, a fairly good job of it okay so um taking this as a hypothetical even as a hypothetical, right? Let's say you're a hardcore scientist and you're like, oh, I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure I really believe that. Well, here's some, here's some scientific proof that is actually, you know, that people have, have used um, to try to show that water may be able to absorb, store, and transmit this energy. So if water can do this, and as I said, the cerebrospinal fluid is 99% water, could the cerebrospinal fluid actually absorb, store, and transmit energy of the source? Put that out there. Um, I've been interacting with uh, Veda Austin. She has a master class. She's a water researcher, a public speaker, mother artist, uh, author. She's dedicated the last 10 years of observing and photographing the life of water, what she calls it. Right? So she believes that water is a fluid intelligence um, and, um, and, and, and it is observing itself through every living organism on the planet and in the universe. So what she does is she photographs water um, in its state of creation in between liquid and ice. And if you go to her website, she's got these remarkable sort of photos um, where, where, uh, where water is actually representing an, an image or, um, or some sort of energy that was actually infused into the water prior to the water undergoing this crystallization process. Um, she has a, a number of master classes. She teaches people how to do it. Um, she's looking at actually working with Dr. Pollock in terms of how to design a, you know, a controlled study because everybody wants, you know, it's a sort of a controlled study. How many times do we have to reproduce it, et cetera, et cetera. Well, she's been reproducing it over and over again. Now she actually wants to work with, with somebody at a university to try to really um, 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 reproduce this research and try to publish it because it's, it's pretty fascinating. Um, we said we we heard we heard somebody coming in from Nadi. Um, well, uh, I've been contacted by Dr. Deep and now working with Dr. Deep. So Dr. Deep uh, is a is a physician. He works in uh, he's uh, he was born in Varanasi, India, um, and he is the world's foremost expert on on Nadi. And so um, there are uh, over seventy two thousand Nadi channels in the human body, and he uh, sort of born in born into this world with this intimate knowledge of all of them. Uh, and based on his, um, it, you know, his experience, essentially, um, that Nadi is this binding energy from unmanifested to manifested, right? That Nadi is a rhythm of beingness, being in oneness, right? So I call this source, right? Uh, the Nadi rhythm is a foundation of unity for bringing all diversified practices to retain the original state of totality. Right. That Nadi water, okay, so now we go from 
here's this energy, right? This binding energy um, that knotty water is the water of the cell during the embryonic stage of totipotency and it becomes the cerebrospinal fluid in the spine. All right, so that's that's coming from that's coming from that's coming from him. Okay, that the knotty rhythm is present that we can actually that that, that we can actually instill the knotty rhythm and have it be present in a drop of water, creating a unity of divine nature rhythmic manifestation, sort of a a, a universe within each drop drop of water. Um, that knotty pulsating water brings totality within us, among us, around us, everywhere and beyond. He has spoken to the United Nations about this, and the government of India has actually included knotty water in its, uh, in, in, in its health policy. Okay, that's pretty incredible, right? So I'm actually working with him and we're looking at doing, we're looking at crystallizing uh, this knotty water. We're looking at growing cells um, with knotty water and without knotty water and seeing if we could see a difference. We're looking at um, exposing stem cells to knotty water and doing, you know, very, uh, very detailed um, um, studies on RNA transcription and, 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 and things like that. Um, and so this is all kind of, you know, in the works. Um, but it's very fascinating that from his perspective, right, this knotty water is 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 in is the water of the cell during the embryonic stage and that it becomes a cerebrospinal fluid and so if this energy is presence in that then whether you look at it from a homeopathic perspective whether you look at it from a from a you know from a um a a a, a crystalline perspective whichever way you want to look at it Maybe there is some sort of energy, right, that's still present in our cerebrospinal fluid through the water itself that's actually connecting us back to our totipotent embryonic state, which was one cell, two cells, four cells, eight cells, right? And what, what the, the reason I bring this up is because um, there, are, there are certain practices that I can guide people into of going back through into that to the embryo and people may have actually had this experience themselves when they're like in a deep state of meditation when they're it may be getting craniosacral therapy when they're getting some sort of body work polarity massage or even sleep where they feel as if i feel like i was the embryo and i feel like i was before it was like before the before the fertilization oh right and then how far how kind of far back can you go in that in that realm Okay, so here he is um, blessing a copper rod. Um, the knotty energy can be transmitted through the copper rod. Um, and therefore, if water is exposed to the knotty energy copper rod, the water then uh, obtains the knotty energy. We can then drink it or grow cells with it, et cetera, et cetera. And those are some of the studies that are on that are ongoing. Okay. So we go back into, you know, why are the ventricles the way they are, right? So now I told you every, all this stuff about water and this, this possible knotty energy um, in the cerebrospinal fluid through the water, right? Now, allow your imagination to play, right? And not allow, allow your consciousness, uh, you, you, you know, your ability to just sort of be curious, to play, be like, oh, that's, you know why is the ventricle like that why does it have to go why does it send this projection all the way back here to the occipital lobe to my you know to where my visual cortex is why why couldn't it just make a you know just does a uter why isn't it just a blob of water in the in the middle so you know any of your any of your answers to those questions would be fascinating of which unfortunately i don't have time to go into but the other way scientifically of looking at this is well Here's the wall, here's the wall of the of the ventricle. And so what are the receptors on the wall of the ventricle that could be actually getting the information? Right. And so there's photoreceptors that perceive light, there's chemoreceptors that perceive growth factors, ions, and hormones, and then there's mechanoreceptors that receive flow, movement, and vibration. Right? So just there, right? So we can actually uh, transmit based on the receptor that are that are present, right? This fluid could transmit light, vibrations, movement, and molecules, just as it was transmitting that same information probably to the starfish from the seawater itself, okay? So, um, 
imagine then that the CSF is this vehicle of, 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 of information that it can transmit this information uh, to the brain through the fluid. And now that we know it's not actually only contained in the ventricles, it's actually it's contained throughout the whole throughout the whole brain. It's actually in the brain tissue itself. OK, and so that's really that's really that's really that's really important. Um, the other part of this transmission is that if something comes into the fluid, there's no barriers, there's no blockages to getting it to important major areas of the brain, all right, that, that you don't need synapses, and that you can get this synchronized sort of all areas of the brain can actually be perceiving this information simultaneously, right? So you get this synchronized sort of like oh, sensation that may, that may, that may occur through an energy that is received by the fluid okay whether that be a molecule like a hormone or a vibration or whatever it might be okay so since we know okay so now here's where the exciting part of the research comes because now we're looking at um all right well see it's, the movement of the cerebrospinal fluid is actually important because we don't want this river to stagnate okay so that's pretty much Although people in the medical world don't say river, that's pretty much what they're what, 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 we're, what we're thinking is we don't want this fluid to stagnate, right? So what causes the CSF to move? And now there's a ton of research. You're going to see this in the next five years. I guarantee you this is going to explode with ways to get our cerebrospinal fluid to move because we need this inner column to be pulsating. We need it to be vibrant. We need it to be this, this, this vibrant uh, uh, river within us that's cleansing our brain, that's bringing new hormones and molecules um, and, and, and energy, whatever that might be, right? So we know physiologically that the heartbeat can do it, right? So as the heart beats, cerebrospinal fluid moves. We know, as I've showed you before, sleep Okay. Now there's just a study published maybe two months ago that showed that directed ultrasound can cause the cerebrospinal fluid to move. And the, and this, this system in between the brain, which is called the glymphatic system, um, to, to, to increase the movement of the flow of the fluid through this glymphatic system in the brain, cleaning out toxins. They just showed that sensory stimulation, intense visual stimulation, it was a visual stimulation. Okay. They did a, they flashed a checkerboard in front of people, caused the cerebrospinal fluid to move. Now, you know, when you go to some of these conferences and you see these strobe lights, right? And, and ca causing altered states of consciousness or altered states of reality or sort of a, a well, what they're calling a sober psychedelic state, whatever that might be that, that they are, you're using strobe lights, light, right? Sound, whatever it might be. And how is virtual reality going to come into place, right? Are we going to be able to use virtual reality to actually stimulate the flow of the cerebrospinal fluid if we have difficulty um, sleeping or getting into um, or, or, or allowing that fluid to, to move, right? One of, the, one, one of the coolest things, though, that has really come out is breath, right? Because breath has been used for millennia to affect our consciousness. Beth has been used for millennia to affect our, our state of our state of reality, right? You look at everything from holotropic breath work to Wim Hof to pranayama breathing to alternate nostril breathing to whatever it might be. Okay, well, breath is, is it, 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 it's a potent conscious that we actually have conscious control of our breath and therefore can actually have conscious control of the movement of the cerebrospinal fluid in our brain, in our spine, um, uh, in our third ventricle, okay? So this is from um, 2018. This is the raw research that looks at inspiration from all levels going all the way down to L4, lumbar vertebra four to cranial three. When we inspire, we are bringing cerebrospinal fluid towards the brain at all levels. When we expire, we are pushing the cerebrospinal fluid down from about T6, thoracic vertebra six down, okay? This was just published 2022, immediate impact of yogic breathing on pulsatile cerebrospinal fluid dynamics. Participants were instructed to breathe in five different ways, spontaneous breathing, slow breathing, deep abdominal breathing, deep diaphragmatic breathing, and deep chest breathing. All right. They considered slow breathing, deep abdominal breathing, and deep, uh, sorry, they considered 
deep abdominal breathing, deep diaphragmatic breathing, and deep chest breathing as yogic breathing. Okay. Then they did, uh, while people were breathing in these various states, they took an MRI of the brain to see changes in the CSF flow. There was a 16 to 28% increase in the power and velocity of the cerebrospinal fluid flow into the skull during yogic breathing compared to spontaneous breathing. Deep abdominal breathing was the one that led to a most statistically significant increase in cerebrospinal fluid oscillation. So listen to the language that they're using. Even this is, this is, this is fairly rigorous research, right? Cerebrospinal fluid oscillation. Okay. And this is where that sort of playful awareness comes in. When's the last time you thought about your cerebrospinal fluid oscillation? Well, you can start thinking about it now. <laughs> hey, how is your fluid actually oscillating? How is it moving? Right? Imagine it as, 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 as a tub of water inside the middle of your brain, outside your brain, bathing your brain, right? How is it oscillating? What are the energy frequencies that you are choosing to induce? What are the energy frequencies that you are choosing to induce, to expose yourself to, to create, that is actually causing some sort of oscillation, rhythmic, pulsatile, resonant frequency within this fluid, right? And I would recommend some sort of inquiry into this, right? Um, not only, right, not only can the breath increase uh, the movement of the cerebrospinal fluid, and what they're looking at now is then can breath work actually lead to um, decreased neurodegenerative diseases and improved recovery from concussion and increased cleansing of the brain? Um, they're looking at all that, right? Um, that's going to be fascinating research that's going to come out. There was research that just showed that slow breathing and increasing your heart rate, rate, heart rate variability through slow breathing actually decreased um, markers of Alzheimer's disease in the blood of, uh, in the blood of people who practice these practices. They couldn't figure out the mechanisms, but guess what? One of the mechanisms was that they hypothesized that through the breath work, you're actually increasing the movement of the flow of the cerebrospinal fluid, increasing the cleansing of the, of the, of the, of the brain of these toxins. And therefore you're getting rid of some of these uh, markers of, of, um, of Alzheimer's right now, right? Imagine just through breathing that you can actually activate your cerebrospinal fluid in your spine that you can create a pulsatile movement of your spine, that you can create a pulsatile movement of this fluid coming into contact with your ventricle. Boom, boom, boom. Almost like a drumbeat, right? The internal drumbeat, creating sort of like an internal drumbeat within your own ocean of the cerebrospinal fluid within your brain, sort of creating a resonance, right? Now, what that does, we're not entirely sure. I was trying to fund, I was trying to get funding for research to do it. Unfortunately, it, it's, very, it's very challenging to kind of figure this out. Does the movement, you know, can the movement of the cerebrospinal fluid that's affecting the ventricle, right? Can that actually, can we see not just because of thoughts or what's happening, but can we see a change in uh, an, an, a state based on the movement of the flow of the cerebrospinal fluid? And so we're looking into ways of sort of designing those experiments. Right. This leads us also into DMT. Many people uh, may have tried this. It's a powerful psychedelic. Um, it's found in animals, plants, and humans, um, and it's used by various cultures for ritual uh, ritual purposes as an entheogen, right? bringing us closer to to source, bringing us closer uh, to God, having an experience of of universal oneness, whatever that might be. Well. We have endogenous DMT and it's found in the brain. It's found in the cerebrospinal fluid. It's also found in the pineal gland. Um, the two enzymes that are required to make DMT in the body have been co-localized in the brain tissue, in the choroid plexus and in the adrenal gland. Why is it important to the choroid plexus? Because the choroid plexus is the organ that is responsible for making the most cerebrospinal fluid. Right? So if we have these two enzymes that are co-localized in the choroid plexus, now they still haven't looked at DMT in the choroid plexus itself, but that's the next study that's going to be done. 
Um, but it is found in the cerebrospinal fluid, and it's actually found at pretty high concentrations in the cerebrospinal fluid. Okay. When they look at the brain tissue itself, what they found is that the DMT in the brain is produced at the same level as dopamine and serotonin. Right. So we all talk about dopamine, serotonin. Oh, yeah, I know those. Okay. Yeah. I, a serotonin selective reuptake inhibitor, you know, for, oh, wait, DMT is at the same amount. Ah, huh. why aren't we talking about that a little bit more? Right. And so a, lo a lot of research is going into what is the actual function of endogenous DMT in the human body. Um, there's funding that's we're trying to collect funding. Uh, if you're interested in sort of funding research, uh, I'm working with a nonprofit, DMTQuest.org. Uh, you can um, you can you can donate there. But um, it's really about trying to sort of you know look at endogenous DMT research and what endogenous DMT actually does. The studies that were recently done showed that there was a 600% increase in DMT in the visual cortex of rodents after a uh, after a heart attack, a uh, myocardial infarction, right? So can we learn how to modulate DMT levels endogenously, right? I throw these questions out for your inquiry. <laughs> okay, so um, our entire central nervous system is suspended in this fluid, right? Maybe, maybe this fluid is actually an intermediary between the infinite and the finite sort of a condensation of a less condensed energy form, right? By breathing, uh, we can create a rhythm in the fluid by sort of like an undulating process, oscillating. This has the ability to bring vibrations, energy, frequency to the fluid, which can transmit the rhythms of life. And if, there's, if it's a bridge, if it's a bridge through the fluid, through the water, and the water is absorbing energy from the infinite, from source, let's say naughty energy, right? As this bridge, as this conduit, is it, could it be a connection to, 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 to source, to God, um, to undifferentiated manifest, uh, undifferentiated, unmanifested potential energy? Yeah. Now, again, I mentioned water and just a few more, um, few more slides, but the question is, is could the cerebrospinal fluid actually be our internal battery? Okay. So these are the words of Yogananda. Um, the consciousness enters the body by way of the brain and spine. The fact remains we can never know anything except through the medium of the senses so long uh, as the life force remains trapped in the body. There is a way out forever. It is for the life source, source life force to merge with the cosmic energy. So there's this merging for the consciousness to merge into the infinite consciousness. The way to accomplish this uh, is to withdraw the life force from the center, from the senses and center it on the spine to direct it upward through the spine to the brain and thence out the Christ center between the eyebrows. The spine is the highway to the infinite. The spine and the brain are the altars of God. That's where the electricity, right? So this word of electricity of God flows down into the nervous system, into the world. And the searchlights of your senses are turned outward, but when you will reverse the searchlights through Kriya Yoga and, and be concentrated in the spine, you will behold the maker. That's what self-realization teaches you, the technique of meditation, recharging the body battery with cosmic energy. For it is not a creed or dogma, but a science of soul and spirit. How the soul descended from the cosmic consciousness into the earth and the body and the senses is the purpose of this work. So, electricity, body battery, right? Cosmic energy. Okay. So um, this is the work of Dr. Pollock um, that under certain conditions, water can go into this fourth phase and it happens primarily on um, hydro when it's close to a hydrophilic surface. Okay. What it happens is that it forms uh, an exclusion zone. So here's, here's a hydrophilic surface here. Okay, and it forms an exclusion zone where this zone becomes uh, sort of what they call, you know, crystal, cr liquid crystal, it's H3O2, and it disperses, it becomes negatively charged, and it disperses particles over to the positively charged side, all right? So now what you have is you actually have, in the water itself, you have um, a, a creation of, of charges that have been, that have been separated, okay? Now, it occurs next to hydrophilic surface, and guess what? The outside of your cell membrane is hydrophilic, OK? 
Okay, so it's consistent. Um, the input for this for this fourth phase to occur can occur um, through energy. They've shown that infrared energy can cause this. Um, so infrared light can cause this. Um, but essentially, what it does is 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 that it creates an, what we what we would consider to be an internal battery, converting chemical energy into electrical energy. So this radiant energy, right, water being the transducer, whatever radiant energy comes in, okay, that it separates the charge in the water, and then you have an output from this, um, from the chemical energy actually being separated, you have chemical physical energy, optical energy, electrical energy, mechanical energy, and radiant energy that can all be outputs. Okay, so the, um, so, you know, the, the, the real question is, is that, when this forms, right, that if we have a negatively charged and a positively charged, if those ions start to move, then we can actually get electrical energy generated to light a light bulb. We create a circuit, and now as the charges move, we actually get energy. We get electrical energy that's formed through it, okay? And so the question here is, um, could the circuit actually be our body and so therefore through a, a process that we go through right we're structuring our water we're structuring the cerebrospinal fluid we're structuring the water within us um it goes into a fourth phase there's actually a micro sort of a micro battery that's actually set up and then you see all these images of of illumination that we actually can internally right illuminate uh that's a question all right so um here we go here's the cerebrospinal fluid right bathing right now the inside of your brain going all the way down your spinal cord going by bathing the outside of your brain right as a bridge you know everything it does scientifically now take it just a, an element beyond could you connect with the energy of the fluid uh, as a fluid that's actually going throughout your entire brain that is 99% water? That the water itself is interacting with, the water molecules itself is interacting with energy that it's exposed to, right? That this is uh, a, a, a conduit, that this is a bridge from the, from the infinite to the finite and back to the infinite. It's a two. It's a two-way highway, right? Whether this compound or whether this cerebrospinal fluid can can transmit uh, melatonin, DMT, growth factors, electrolytes, whatever it might be, to the brain, which we know it does, or resonant frequency, right? Some sort of resonant frequency that it's interpreting from the external environment, from the world and the internal environment, and transmitting that to our brain. And so essentially, right, now we, we put it all, all together, okay? So we bring awareness to the cerebrospinal fluid. We can do anything. We can breathe, we can dance, we can sing, hum, but you're knowing, knowing that you are actually changing the resonant frequency of this fluid. With each inspiration, you're pulling the fluid up the spine to your brain, collecting the heart energy as it travels past the heart. You can even add a Kegel exercise or a perennial floor activation to help pump the fluid from your sacrum. You can activate your parasympathetic system to help the fluid flow through your brain tissue without having to fall asleep. You can connect with the endogenous hormones and growth factors, neurotransmitters that are in the cerebrospinal fluid and the DMT itself. You can connect with the water element. You can allow the structured water to form within you as an internal energy source becoming illuminated radiant energy that's within us 
through the water, connecting to the unmanifested as an energy, as the CSF can hold this total memory of the universe. Connecting to the Nadi energy, to this binding energy from I am to all love and from all love to I am. And we rest in that. Wow. 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 <laughs>